Father, we come to you on this Lord's Day. We thank you once again to just come and worship you. We thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus, what he did for us in Calvary. Continue to pray for those victims out there in Maui and just elsewhere here locally that had the flooding and, and just uh, people all around this nation, Lord, that they need to realize they need to turn to Jesus as their Savior. And so, Father, we just pray that you guide us and direct us in our lives and just uh, we pray for our leaders, Lord, that they're heading on the wrong path. They're following Satan rather than Jesus. And so, Father, we just pray that uh, our corrupt government, corrupt law enforcement, judges, and just uh, our whole nation, Lord, is just completely corrupt. And so, Father, we just pray that it, it, it'll turn from Satan and turn to Jesus. And, and uh, it's the only thing that's going to get this nation back on its path. It doesn't matter who's in the White House or anything else. It's not the not the people in, in Washington. It, it's uh, the only thing that's going to do it is when people are saved and, and truly following Jesus. And not just carnal Christians, but rather Christians that are being obedient to the Word of God. And that's the only thing that's going to save this nation. And so, Father, we know that you can still perform a miracle, and that's what we pray for, Lord, that uh, postpone things, the complete destruction of this nation until after the rapture. And so, Father, we just pray that you be with us during this service and just give your servant the words to speak and just thank you for those that are here and listening online. We just pray, Lord, that you keep us all healthy and safe. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be continuing our study on the I Am Statements by Jesus. This will be part four. We looked at five I Am Statements in the book of Psalms already. And we're going to look at the sixth one. So the sixth I Am Statement in Psalms is found in Psalm 102 in verse 7. So if you would, turn to Psalm 102, verse 7. Now, Psalm 102, verse 7. Let's read that. I watch, and I am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. You know, remember, as a reminder, that uh, these I am statements are statements that are about Jesus, that, that uh, you know, they have multi-purposes, that, you know, a lot of times they're actually by the psalmist, which are oftentimes with David or whatever, too. But... They were also, you know, directly referenced to Jesus. So, you know, this is the first of two I am statements found in Psalm 102. Though there are two more in Psalm 102, verse 6. You know, I said last week that we're really going to be looking at verse 6 and 7. So, let's go ahead and go back one verse. Go to Psalm 102, verse 6. So, Psalm 102, verse 6. I am like a pelican of the wilderness. I am like an owl of the desert. And then verse 7 again. I watch and I am as a sparrow alone upon the housetop. Now we saw last week that Psalm 69 had uh, three I am statements in it. In verse 8, verse 20, and verse 29. And then now here... In Psalm 102, like I said, we have these, uh, it's going to be, well, if you want to count verse 6, you got verse 6 and 7, and then you'll, we're going to see later on verse 11. But, but these three I am statements about animals, you know, that I'm talking about in verses 6 and 7 here, we saw, I am like a pelican in the wilderness, I am like an owl of the desert, and then verse 7, I watch and I am as a sparrow. So, you know, you take out the watch, you know, I am as a sparrow. So these three I am statements about animals are all related, and thus this is counted as just one I am statement. But you could make it so there are nine instead of seven here in Psalms, you know. So, you know, if you really want to, I guess, get technical, whatever. But, but this sixth statement does not directly say I am. You know, as I said, you know, it has, you know, I watch and in between the I am, but, you know, it's still part of it or whatever. 
Now the writer of Psalm 102 is unknown, but speaks of affliction. It also speaks of the future affliction of Jesus at his first coming. In Psalm 102, verse 6, Jesus says, I am like a pelican and an owl. Now before I continue with that, I mentioned that uh, I said that the Psalm 102 here speaks of its affliction and, and its future affliction by Jesus of his first coming. And I said that you know, these, uh, the I am statements in Psalms, in, in the book of Psalms here, then they, um, you know, are dealing with the first coming of Jesus. You know, we're going to see later on that certain statements, you know, are, are, taught, are during his time of his first coming. And then some are dealing with, like in John and so forth, dealing with his deity and so forth. So, you know, we see, we see, uh, <coughs> You know, the different I am statements have like different periods or whatever. But these are dealing with the first coming of Jesus here. But as I said, these, uh, you know, the I am like a pelican in an owl. And these birds were unclean birds to the Israelites. And Jesus was treated as if he was unclean, just like these birds. You know, if you went through Leviticus where it talks about like all the clean and unclean animals and so forth, you would see that the owl and pelican were unclean. In fact, the owl is often associated with Satan. And, you know, obviously Jesus is not associated with Satan in, in being that way. But that's basically how he was treated. He was treated as if, you know, they thought they were holy and righteous, not realized they were the Pharisees and so forth, realizing they were actually serving Satan. But they, uh, you know, they thought they were holy and righteous and, and thought Jesus, who was, really the holy and righteous one as, you know, as unclean. Or, you know, remember they even compared to him and said, you know, like, you know, that he was Satan, you know, when they said, you know, be called him Beelzebub and so forth. And that, you know, he's casting out devils in the name of Beelzebub. And, you know, so they were trying to basically say that, you know, he was doing things under the power of Satan when really they're the ones that were under the control of Satan. So, you know, he was treated as if he was one of those type of unclean birds. Now, Jesus was often alone with God the Father, just like the owl is alone. You know, owls, for the most part, are very solitary birds. You know, they just kind of hang out there by themselves and, and hoot and howl. And, and, you know, they're just they're a lonely bird for the most part, except for mating and, and, and a few things like that. But, but Jesus was also left alone by his disciples when he was arrested and when he went to the cross. You know, remember when, once he got arrested, every one of his disciples, you know, the apostles abandoned him. Now, eventually, a couple of them did kind of follow him or whatever and so forth. And then John would later be there at the cross. But for the most part, basically everybody abandoned him. Now, Psalm 102, verse 7, speaks of the sparrow when Jesus says, I am as a sparrow. Now, remember, I took out the watch and end in between but you know basically he's saying i am as a sparrow now the sparrow is normally always with its mate unless the mate dies and then it will sit on housetops alone and cry so just the opposite of the owl who is normally solitary the sparrow is always with its mate you know they do everything together they they they, they always going together and <clears throat> Basically, the only time it's alone is if one of the mates dies, and then it'll sit up on the housetops alone and cry. You know, Jesus was normally with his disciples unless he was off praying, but he was left alone when he was arrested. You know, so for the most part, Jesus was kind of like that. You know, he was always with them, but then there were times he would go alone when he was praying, you know, to God the Father. But for the most part, then... You know, he was always with his disciples. As I said, he was abandoned by them when, when he got arrested and, you know, for most part of his time at the cross. He, was, he then was left by God on the cross as Jesus, like the sparrow and owl, cried out because he was alone. You know, remember that God the Father had to even himself turn away from, from Jesus, his own son, because he was bearing the sins, excuse me, of the world. 
and God the Father just cannot look upon sin. So even if it was, you know, being born by his own son. So we kind of see the, the, the semblance there of, you know, how Jesus was kind of like these different birds where, you know, he's saying that I am these birds. Now let's look at uh, the seventh I am statement in Psalms is found in Psalm 102, verse 11. So let's go down a few verses and look at Psalm 102, verse 11. So Psalm 102, verse 11. My days are like a shadow that declineth, and I am withered like grass. So Jesus said, I am withered like grass. Jesus here spoke of his death as he came to earth for one purpose, and that was to die for the sins of all people for all time. Now just as grass withers away and dies, so did Jesus as he hung on that cross, bearing the world's sins. You know, he, he basically in one sense he kind of withered away. You know, he didn't completely wither away, but he, you know, he bore the sins of the world. He's just hanging on that cross, you know, waiting for his time to die. You know, the grass, you know, you let, grass, you know, it tells us, you know, it just, you know, it, it withers away. You know, it starts drying out in the summertime and, you know, in the droughts and just kind of withers away and, you know, dries up and it's no longer green, you know, showing that life. But Jesus himself, you know, he withered away, he, he, just like that grass when he died for us on that cross. Now, a shadow also goes away after sunset. You know, this first speaks of, says, my days are like a shadow that declineth. You know, and a, sh a shadow, once the sun goes down, the shadow, it declines, it's gone. You know, it, 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 the shadow, and, and even, you know, a lot of times during the bright, bright sun, you know, it's, it's more of, um, you know, the morning or the, or the evening or something like that. But, you know, a shadow, as I said, you know, once the sun goes down, the, the, the shadow is gone. Now, Jesus died for us so that his death would bring us life. He rose from the grave to be alive today, and withered grass can be revived to grow again. You know, I said that, you know, oftentimes in the summer, you know, you start getting a drought or whatever, you know, the grass starts all drying up, you know, and it gets all crumbly and hard and, you know, you don't want to be walking on it barefoot, you know, it hurts and stuff. But boy, all of a sudden you get a good rain and boy, that grass will just pop back up again and, and you know, it comes back to life. Well, that's how Jesus was, you know, he died for us for our sins as he bore the sins of the world. <coughs> Excuse me. But then on that third day, he rose from that grave again. You know, so that he remains alive today, seated, seated, seated on the right side of God the Father. But just as Jesus became alive again, that's what, that's what grass does. Like I said, you get that good rain, and boy, it just brings back up again. Next thing you know, it's a foot tall, and you know, you, you had it mowed in a while, and now you're mowing it every two days again, or something. So, you know, it's just like that withered grass. You think it's all dead and gone. But like I said, good rain with lightning and stuff gets a right. Well, same with Jesus. Everybody, you know, the devil thought he defeated Jesus. You know, he was dead. But three days later, he came alive. And, you know, like I said, he's still alive today. You know, and that's what separates Christianity from other, these false religions. You know, Jesus is alive. Whereas Muhammad or Buddha or, you know, the, the popes or, you know, even Mary, you know, herself... All these people, they, they, they're, they're not alive anymore, you know, so Confucius or whatever. So, you know, uh, you know, that, that's, that's the difference here. You know, we serve a living God. But we all die a physical death unless we are raptured, but can have life if we are saved. You know, so that's what Jesus is representing here is that, you know, we're kind of like that grass. You know, it speaks of people, you know, we're like grass that withers away. You know, we live for a while, and if, you know, unless something happens to you, whatever, you know, you live to old age, and you just kind of wither away. You know, you uh, start, body starts falling apart and different things, and you just finally, you just go off and die. You know, so we die that physical death, but if you've been saved, 
that's not the end of it. You're going to have, you know, everlasting life because Jesus has given us that life due to his rising from the grave so that now that we can get to go and go to be to heaven with Jesus. And so all of us, you know, and like I said, now if, you, if you've been unsaved, you know, if you're not saved, you're unsaved, you die, you're also going to die spiritually. You know, you already were dead spiritually. So, you know, you're never going to be alive. You know, you'll never really see, you know, spiritual life. But like I said, so all of us will die that physical death. You know, there'll be a few of us. The rapture's coming soon, and it's coming very soon, I believe. And then, um, you know, those will not see a physical death. But the rest of us, you know, will see a physical death. And so you're like that grass that withers away. You know, the vast majority of people throughout the history of man has always died, you know, withered off and died like grass. You know, like I said, it's been a few exceptions, like, Enoch or Elijah and so forth. So, you know, that basically that's what Jesus is trying to explain here in this, this statement here where he's, he's, I am withered like grass. You know, that's what he was talking about. You know, he died for mankind. And then, but then just like grass, as I said, he sprung to life again and, you know, allowed us so that we could have everlasting life. So those were the seven I am statements there in the book of Psalms. Now let's move on to, um, we're going to look at some in Matthew. So if you would, just turn to Matthew for now. We'll, we'll get you the chapters and stuff in the, when we get there, but just get yourself into leaf Matthew. So there are seven basic I am statements found in Matthew that most people do not include. You know, as I said, you know, the very beginning of this study that, you know, people think of the I am statements of John. But like I said, I'm giving you some from other parts of, of Scripture that it shows you that there's more to it than just John. As I said, so the ones in Matthew, most people did not include, but these show the purpose of why Jesus came to earth in his first coming and show us the character of Jesus. So, you know, the ones in Psalms, then they were basically dealing with things, you know, you know, again, the character of Jesus and also his first coming. And then once here in Matthew, the same thing, that now that, you know, they're again dealing with his first coming, but they're showing you why he came in his first coming. And then, you know, later on we'll see some in Genesis and John that show the deity of him and so forth. And we'll look at some others in, in Revelation, his character and so forth like that, but... Um, so, you know, basically that's what the purpose is for the ones in Matthew, you know, was to show, you know, why Jesus came and, you know, and, and also to show his character. Now, remember, Matthew was written to the Jews to show them that Jesus is their Messiah and King. Now, most of these statements are only found in Matthew with one in Luke as well. You know, so... There's one of them that gets repeated in Luke that we'll take a look at, but the rest of them are basically just found in Matthew. And as again, I said, I, I believe it's a purpose because Matthew was written, you know, each of the Gospels had its own purpose, you know, that Matthew was to show that, that to the, it was written for the Jews to show them that Jesus is their Messiah and King. You know, remember, they were all looking for, you know, Jesus to come, and they wanted him to rule there, you know, coming in on Palm Sunday, you know, overthrow the Romans and all that stuff. Well, that wasn't Jesus' purpose here. You know, then you had Mark, which is, was written to show Jesus as a servant. You had Luke written to show Jesus as the Son of Man. And then John was written to show Jesus as the Son of God or his deity. So, you know, they have a purpose, but that's why I believe these things are found in Matthew. And, and not necessarily in the other Gospels. Now, the first I am statement found in Matthew is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, where Jesus said, I am not come to destroy. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Okay, let's read that verse. So Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. 
So Jesus was accused of breaking the law, such as doing miracles on the Sabbath. But Jesus said he had not come to destroy the law or the teachings of the prophets, but rather he came to fulfill the law. You know, remember he, he, he had said that he was Lord of the Sabbath and so forth. That, you know, he came, to, you know, he never broke the law. You know, he, he was the only one that was ever sinless that ever fulfilled, you know, you know, never broke the law once, not even once. You know, he, because he didn't come here to destroy the law. He came here to fulfill the law. As I said, so Jesus is the only person to ever live who never violated the law. Jesus gave the law to Moses, and the Jews could not see that. You know, it was Jesus himself who is the one that spoke to Moses and actually gave him the law, and actually, you know, with his finger wrote the law in the stone. You know, in fact, the first carvings of stone, he carved out himself. You know, the next time Moses had to do it because he broke the first one. So God said, well, you can go make the stones this time. But, you know, it's still God, you know, in this case, Jesus, who wrote, actually wrote the, the laws and gave them to Moses. So, you know, he didn't break the law. He knew the laws. He, he's the one that, you know, gave them to Moses. You know, he never, you know, he never broke the law. You know, but he... But the Jews could just not see that, you know, and that's why they were accusing him of certain things. But as I said, Jesus never voided the Ten Commandments, but always taught to obey them. You know, remember when he had one time he had, uh, I believe it was he had cast a, a devil out of a person or something. I cannot remember exactly what it was now. And he told him to go back to the priest and to fulfill, you know, to be obedient to the law, you know, make the sacrifice that was, you know, required by the law. You know, so he never said, you know, because at the time, the sacrifices and everything, they were still in effect, you know, not until after his death and so forth. And, you know, so he, you know, he never said, you know, go break this law. You know, he just said, you know, he'd always tell him, be obedient to it, go do this, go do that. You know, remember he'd tell him, you know, to to uh, love thy neighbor, and then, you know, the guy would try to justify himself, well, who's my neighbor? Well, you know, he doesn't live next door to me, so he's not my neighbor, you know, he's two doors down or whatever, you know, he lives on the other street. And Jesus basically saying, you know, we saw that with Good Samaritan story, that, you know, whoever you come in contact with is your neighbor, you know, that whoever, you know, you meet at Walmart, you know, that's not your neighbor or whatever, so to speak. It's not necessarily literally, you know, the person that's living next door to you. And so, you know, he, he never allowed people these loopholes that to try to get out of avoiding, you know, uh, obeying the law. Because like I said, he didn't come here to destroy the law, but to obey it. You know, in fact, today, you know, we're not necessarily under the law, we're under grace. But he, like I said, he never avoided the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are still there. You know, the only one that's basically in one sense, not in effect, is, is the, you know, the Sabbath day. And, um, you know, in one sense, it still is that, you know, we still need to have a day to worship the Lord. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, technically the Sabbath would be Saturday. And, you know, we worship on Sunday, the Lord's day, because that's the day he rose from the grave, uh, you yeah, know, rose from the grave. But, you know, the other ones, I mean, you know, there's it's still an effect, you know, thou shalt not murder, you know, thou shalt, you know, you know, love thy father and mother, you know, honor thy father and mother and so forth, you know, but, you know, thou shalt only have, you know, one God, you know, thou shalt not covet, you know, thou shalt not steal and, you know, and so forth like that. So, the, you know, those things are not void. It's not like all of a sudden, oh, well, we're under grace now, so it's okay, we've got murder and steal and cheat and, and commit adultery and, um, be disobedient, serve other gods, and all that kind of stuff. It's good. You know, the, the, the Ten Commandments are still very much in effect. In fact, when this nation used to hang the Ten Commandments in courtrooms and schools and, and, and so forth, and people would see those things, and this nation was a different nation, and it wasn't perfect, but you didn't have the rebellion that you see nowadays because people would see these things, you know, Thou shall not, you know, do this or that or whatever. And, you know, it makes you think a little bit when you see these things every day. You come into the schoolroom or something like that. You know, where now, you know, they try to, you know, get rid of these things. So, 
but you know, like I said, there, you know, people always act like, you know, oh, we as Christians, we're, we're not under the law anymore. We're not in one sense under the law, but we are still, the Ten Commandments are still, we're still expected to, you know, obey them. You know, if you look in the New Testament, then they get repeated. Jesus said, you know, different things like, you know, thou shalt not, you know, kill and those type of things, murder and, and, um, you know, committing adultery and, you know, and remember he even said that, that, uh, you know, that if man even looks after a woman to lust after her in her heart, then he has already committed adultery. You know, so it's not even necessary, you know, Jesus was saying, you don't even have to do the physical act. It's just the thinking about it. And he even said the same thing too, that same with, with uh, murder that, you know, you think if you think, you know, you hate in your heart that you want somebody dead, you know, you may not physically go out and kill the person, but in God's eyes, he says that you've already, you know, you're guilty of murder. So, you know, Jesus, in fact, he expanded on the law in, in some respects like that. You know, I never said that in the Old Testament that, well, if you just even think these things, then you're guilty of breaking the law. You know, where Jesus said, you are. So, you know, he didn't void the law. In fact, he kind of, in some ways, expanded upon the law. You know, that, that uh, you know, like I said, if you don't have the law still in effect, you know, we don't go around, you know, like in, in the sense we don't have the sacrificial laws, you know, we don't go around, you know, sacrificing a lamb or a goat or doing things like that. That was never for the Gentiles anyway. But, uh, you know, as far as the Ten Commandments, then yes, we're to be obedient to those. We need to be not necessarily the other 630 or whatever it is laws of the Jews had. But as far as the Ten Commandments, then, you know, those are we are to, to still obey. But this shows... One of the reasons why Jesus came to earth at his first coming, as the law showed we were sinners. You know, it tells us that in James, that, you know, we, we saw that in our study in James, that, 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 you know, that's the whole purpose of a law, is that, you know, without the law, we wouldn't even realize we were sinners. We wouldn't know that we're not supposed to go out and kill somebody, and we're not supposed to serve other false gods, and, and all these kind of things. You know, why do you think that all throughout the world, you know, pretty much all, cultures and stuff, you know, throughout history, they've always, you know, even if they weren't, quote, Christian people, you know, they didn't go around and just always allow all kinds of murder and, and I mean, you know, they still had some uh, obedience to the law, whether they realized it or not, you know, just subconsciously, because it tells us in Romans that, that the law is written on our hearts, you know, so that shows you that it's, it wasn't just written just for the Jews, you know, it might be given to them, but, you know, that's for all of us that, you know, that those things are written on us so that, you know, we know things so that, you know, you go to Central Africa or South America or the jungles or whatever, you know, as a rule, you know, the people, the, the civilizations, they always have these set rules, you know, it's just, you don't randomly, everybody just goes around killing everybody or this or that, you know, that's, that's one reason why, we have the chaos like going on here in this nation or, or you know, some of these other places that, uh, you know, same thing with some of the other things that, you know, they were, you know, a lot of them were, were obedient to these things, whether they realized it or not. Now, of course they served their false gods and so forth like that, but you know, there are certain things that, you know, such as them as the killing and murder that, you know, and it's like, why would they, I mean, if, if you uh, if you're not a Christian and you don't believe, I mean, why shouldn't I be able to go out and murder you or whatever if I don't like you? You know that that there's reasons because, like I said, God has put that law in our hearts that you know it's not been voided. It's not you know it's it's there. You know it's and that that's why. But that was one of the reasons why he came. You know, was to fulfill this law. Like I said, the whole purpose of the law was to show us that we're sinners. You know, like I said, if we didn't have some some pattern of what we're supposed to be, you know, whatever it is, if you if you cannot, how would I know I'm doing something wrong if I don't know that that's wrong? You know, that that's why we have to teach our children, you know, right and wrong. You say, no, you know, you're not supposed to be, you know, taking something that doesn't belong. You don't go and take Johnny's toy. That's his toy. You know, if he lets you borrow it, okay. But, you know, you don't just take his toy from him. That's his or whatever. You know, things like that, that you, you have to teach them that, you know, that that's not, that's stealing if you're taking it, you know, but if you don't, 
have the law to tell you that we're not supposed to steal, then what's wrong with Johnny taking, you know, this little other kid's toy or something? So, you know, that that's the whole point of the law. It's the real because realized we're sinners. And, and that's the key. If you don't recognize that you're not a, if you're not a sinner, you're not going to get saved. You know, you the only way you can get saved is to make you realize that you are a sinner and then you need a savior to save you. And that's when you realize then you need Jesus because, you know, that, that um, like I said, you're not going to get saved if you don't even realize you need to get saved. And as I said, this is why Jesus never got rid of the Ten Commandments, for without them, we would not realize that we were sinners. You know, and as I said, without, without us realizing that, that we were sinners, then... Um, you know, I mean, I don't care. You can talk to them, do whatever you want, all you want. But a person is never going to get saved. You know, it's kind of like uh, somebody that's on drugs or something, you know, whatever. They're never going to quit unless they realize, hey, I've, I'm, I've got a problem. I'm, I'm hooked on drugs and I, I need to get off or, you know, this is wrong or, you know, whatever. That if they don't want to do it or they don't realize they have a problem on it or whatever it is, you know, the, the problem is that they're, that, you know, some kind of sin that they're into, then, you know, if they, if they don't uh, realize it, then they're never going to be, you know, they're never going to stop doing that. And, you know, a person's never going to get saved. You know, you could give them, now that doesn't mean we shouldn't try, you know, give them tracks and do whatever different things. But, you know, those things are never going to stop. I mean, a person's never going to get saved unless they realize that they're, first of all, a sinner. And then they need to get saved. You know, some people realize they're a sinner, but then they're just like, I don't know, but I'm still no more of a sinner than this person, so I still don't need to get saved. So, you know, it's it's, it's a combination of realizing you're a sinner, but then you also need to be saved. You need a Savior. And I can't remember that verse is right now, and I can't find it, but um, but like I said, that's it, it tells us in Scripture that the whole point of the law was to lead us, you know, to make us realize that we were sinners. But we're going to stop here for this week. We'll continue next week with the second I am statement in Matthew. So uh, just keep that in mind. We'll be in looking at some more of them in Matthew starting next week again. So let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time you've given us to continue our study on the I am statements that are found in Scripture. And it's just such a wealth of information. It takes a little while to get through some of this because... There's, there's a lot in here, Lord, that, you know, even this one little verse, that it's it's vitally important to realize that, you know, that was your whole purpose of coming. You know, this is one of the reasons why you came, it's your first coming, is because Jesus had to point out to us, make us all realize that we are sinners. You know, he didn't come to destroy the law, he came to fulfill the law, to make us realize that we are sinners and we needed Jesus as our Savior. That we would not have everlasting life without realizing that. You know, but later on when Jesus will come as the King of Kings and, and, and so forth and will bring that wrath. But, you know, his first coming was not to be the king, you know, overthrow the Romans or anything like that. It was just to make us, to, you know, to realize we are sinners because he died on that cross and rose again on that third day so that he could be our Savior and we could have everlasting life. But it would do, do no good if people did not realize without the law that they were sinners and needed Jesus as their Savior. So, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for sending your son, Jesus. We thank you for what you do for us each and every day. And we just thank you for what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so, Father, we just pray that you bless the second service and just... Uh, be with each and every one. Just continue to guide and direct us. And we just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.